everybody, welcome to Bridge. We're going to get started with some worship this evening, so go ahead and take a stand. When I search the
I got a mic? There it is. Thanks, worship team. Appreciate it. Praise the Lord. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to Bridge. Happy Sunday. What is it? Un de Mayo. Uh, well, <laughs> hope you guys are having a good weekend. I'm Patrick. I um, see a lot of fresh faces, and I know there's people joining us online. So we got our announcements real quick. Um, kids, if you're in here, get out of here. Go have some fun. We got lots planned in the back. Thank you, Miss Sandra, and all of our volunteers. Appreciate it. We're always looking for more volunteers. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Some people get to stay. All right, so we have our potluck today. Thank you guys for bringing things for our fun potluck, and uh, we're excited to eat some good food together because what's more fun than eating together and building fellowship and being come closer to each other and closer to God as a family? Amen. Okay, so here's the, the, the hard truth. So <laughs> our worship team, two-thirds of what was on the stage today, is going to be moving different places to the west in a few short weeks. <laughs> so unless you love bass-only worship, we're looking for everybody. It doesn't matter, which we could do. It's not bad. I'll, I'll, I'll sign up. All right, we're looking for vocalists, keyboard, guitar, ukulele, drums, harmonica. We'll take it. All right, banjo, if you can do the spoon thing. Yeah, no, seriously, singers, if you're shy and you can talk two of your friends into singing with you, we'll just turn up and down the right mics and we'll make sure it all looks good and sounds okay. Right, we're looking for people to join the worship team, and it's really about the heart more than talent. So get your heart in the right place, and we'll work on talent. And uh, yeah, so download here with the link our Spotify just to kind of see what music we play and see how you can kind of fit in and build into this fun community from the stage, from the worship. All right, men's group, uh, so we've got three more meetings of this. It's okay if you haven't been to the first two. There's, it's easy to catch up. There's a book. You can download the QR code here and get the book. You can do the audio version. You can get the paperback. There's a little workbook that comes with it, and it's a lot of fun. To be honest, we kind of go off of this onto tangents and discussions. We get real, and we have deep conversation, and it's great for the men of Bridge to get together and build each other up and encourage each other with many of the similar problems that we all go through in life. And so whether you're young, old, if you have friends, neighbors, anyone that you know that might benefit from this, all are welcome. Just, uh, yeah, sign up and join us for three more uh, Wednesday nights. And now, before we go to the next slide, I did want to say I, we don't have a women's Bible study slide, but there is a women's Bible study for Bridge on Thursday nights. Tracy's got the information. She had sent out something, and so there were some changes. But if you don't know the changes, if you want updates, Tracy, get in touch with Tracy, who was on slides today, if you don't know who. And she'll connect you in with all the details for the women's Bible study as well. All right, so uh, go ahead. Before we do this fun announcement, which uh, Brian Silvestri is going to do for us as he makes his way up, go ahead and do a COVID-friendly, safe high five and welcome to your neighbors here. Do a little blessings and prayer. Thank you. Let me see it. I'm going to use this. All right. All right. I'm using, I'm, I'm not going to lo lose these for you. I hope, hopefully I won't lose them there for you. All right, how's everybody doing? So, talking about this slide, I'm very excited about this. Uh, about a year ago, we talk, I, I mentioned, I gave you some, obviously I gave you my story, my background, what was going on. And, you know, a year ago about this time, uh, to be honest, my, the, the marriage was not going very well. You could talk to my, my daughter here, I'm, I'm going to be discussing it in front of her, but it was not going well. Um, it was a really bad, we were in a really low point in our lives. And uh, through the grace of God, we had an opportunity to go to Colorado and to really go through some healing. Because we pray a lot, but there needs to be healing. And we had an opportunity to go to Colorado. It was a two-week event, and it, was, it, was, uh, it changed my relation. It changed my viewpoint. It changed everything about how I view life, and it changed my relationship with my wife. And so it was such an impactful event that we thought it was so important to bring here to Bridge and to this community. So my wife has been working with the organization, and we're going to have this event here on Friday the 3rd through the 4th. It's going to be food on uh, Friday night, and then food also uh, on, on Saturday morning and for, for breakfast and for, for lunch. But we are flying people in that are facilitators that will, I, I just can't, I can't stress this enough. I don't, it, it's not for marriage, this isn't like a marriage counseling thing, but this is for a healing, individual healing thing. 
So if you, you know, if you find that you're, you're, you're going through struggles, and you're going through trials, and, and all the things that I talked about in my previous sermons about the heart issues and trying to deal with generational issues, this is the, this is the place you need to be. So I just, I really recommend that you give it a shot. It's going to be local. We have it, the, the beauty thing with the, with the um, we didn't think we could even do it at this facility. And with the changes that were happening with uh, the other churches, we can actually do it right here. And praise God for that, because we weren't sure where we were going to do it. We just knew we were going to do it in, in this area. We feel so strong about it. So please consider it. If you have questions, if you want to get into lower level details, you can talk to my wife, talk to me, and we can give you more information. Actually, Will went to, one, went to us. Um, we had, there was one in Arlington, and I invited him and Sandra to it. So you can ask them about how it impacted their lives and their marriage and, and how they view view God and view, view everyone else. So it's a it's, it's huge impact. So, all right, with that, now we're on to sermon. Sermon, okay. Now here's the problem. I am between you and the food. So that's a problem. That's a problem. But I'm going to try to make this as entertaining, efficient as I possibly can because I don't want you guys getting angry, about me, angry at me. So here's the deal. Yeah, I don't want you to get hangry. I'll be throwing out Snickers bars and everything like that. You ever look at certain events, and I just talked about one, certain events, and, you, and, you, and you're at a certain point, and you look backwards, and you're like, you know, how did this happen? And, and I talked about this just going to Colorado. You know, my marriage was in a tough spot, but if you saw me, if you looked at us on Facebook, you would see, hey, they're looking great. Everything's fine. But in, the truth is, underneath, underneath that veneer of happiness, there was a big problem going on uh, within my marriage. And... This opportunity of going to Colorado was crazy. They should have been closed. The, 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 the course should have been locked up and closed. But one person dropped, two people dropped out. And somehow Janice knew somebody who knew somebody. And next thing you know, we're going. We're going to Colorado. And it changed my life. Janice and I always talk about, we look back at some of the stuff like uh, our daughter. And, and um, how she connected with her music instructor. And her, and, and, or my son. I'm like, this is not... This is too weird. Like, God had to actually convince somebody not to call us so that she could get to this opportunity. It's crazy. It's only a God thing. And, and God uses people in the Bible all the time to impact our lives even today. And what, what we're going to dive into is we're going to talk about Acts 13 and 15. Where that's, that's where we are on our story. But before we dive into Acts 13 and 15... I want to go back, and so please get your Bible, get to Acts 13. If you don't have a Bible, I don't know if we have any. Do we have any in the back there? If we do, we can hand them out. If you don't have a Bible, you don't have an app, I'm going to do the best I can to entertain you, but ultimately it's to change you, not me. So here's how it goes. Let's go. Before we go into Acts, I want to actually dive back a little bit. Before we dump, jump into Acts, uh, uh, before we jump into Acts 13, 13, I want to go to Acts 9, okay, we're going to go backwards a little bit, and I want to introduce these characters, Acts 9, 26, now in this, at this moment, in Acts 9, 26, remember Saul, who was, who was a murderer, right, and kind of like, let's put it in this context, like, he murdered somebody in, like, that, that our good friend that followed, that was a believer in Christ, he's murdering people that we know real close to our, to our community here. And Paul goes up to, he's, he's chasing me all the way up to Philly. And on his way to Philly, he changes, right? There's a, con, there's, a, there's a transformation. And we start hearing about this guy transforming who was once a murderer, right? Saul is this murderer that, that, is, that, is, that is just so determined to kill off this movement. And on his way, he changes. And now, he, he's, he's, he's preaching Jesus, and now he's coming back, and he's now at our door. He's like, hey, I want to meet with the guys. I want to meet with you again. And we're like, what? Like, how would you feel about that if I said, hey, I got this guy. I know he, he murdered so-and-so. He's a good friend of ours, but he wants to come and talk to us. How would you feel about that? I'd be a little nervous if I were you. Uh, for me, I'd be a little bit scared about that. But let's go, let's just read a, a little bit about it in, in Acts 9 here. When he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, 
uh, you wonder why. Like, you know, this is the same guy who was killing believers, not believing that he was really a disciple, right? He, but who? But Barnabas took him in and brought him to the apostles. Barnabas brings, is, is, is this kind of like he's interceding. He's, he's coming up to the apostles and saying, listen, I have seen this guy. I've seen what he's doing. It's, he's not lying. This isn't a trap. He's not going to come in here and, and do anything bad. He is the real deal. He's truly transformed. And Barnabas is saying, listen, guys, he told them, Barnabas told them, Saul on his journey, he had seen the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him, and how he was preaching fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul, so he, he actually is that door. Barnabas is that encourager saying to the, to the apostles, let him in, let him talk to you. He's the real deal. He comes in, he talks, and, he, and, and they're astonished of how, what's going on here. But he pisses, he, he's so big into Lord, the Jesus now. He's so immersed in this. He's so transformed. He's speaking boldly in the name of the Lord that the Grecian Jews now want to kill him. The Jews in Jerusalem want to kill him. So what do they do? They say, hey, guys, uh, you got to go to Caesarea. And um, when you're there, hop on a boat. And we'll take you to Tarsus. Caesarea is a port city right on the outside of, um, it's, I mean, we've actually been there. We landed there. It's just north of Tel Aviv. It's a port city. And so he, he gets on a ship and he goes to Tarsus. Imagine if that's where, like, that's the last you hear of, of Paul. Like, Paul goes up to Tarsus, which is north of, of, uh, of uh, Damascus, to preach. You don't hear from Paul anymore. You don't hear from him in, in, in chapters, in the rest of chapters 9 or 10. You have to go to chapter 11. So now let's go into 11. And it says here, uh, 11, let's see here, 11.22, it says, actually I'm going to do 1125. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. Why did Barnabas go to Tarsus? Because they started hearing about Gentiles turning, it says here, actually, I'm, I, am, I am going to read in 22. It says, the news, news of this, because of the, of the um, great number of changes within, within the uh, Gentiles, uh, they heard it from Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived, he saw evidence of the grace of God, and he was glad and encouraged them to remain true to God and in their hearts. And then he basically goes up, Barnabas goes to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brings him back to Antioch. So I want to make sure that, and by the way, if you read this last line, the disciples were called Christians for the first time in Antioch. Okay? So this is the first time you hear the word Christians even in the Bible. I want to give you this background because Barnabas becomes a key player in the story of the first missions trip. So let's jump into, let's go to, now we're going to go into, um, uh, actually, I want to talk real quick about uh, Barnabas. What was he? Look what he says in 24. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. He's, he's a good man. He's, he's, he's strong in his faith. So let's go to 13. Let's go to Acts 13, and we're going to jump into this story of this first missions trip. I'm going to read up, I'm going to, I'm going to actually unpack 13, 14, and 15. I'm going to unpack it like an Oreo cookie. Okay, I'm going, to take, I'm going to take the two ends, the two chocolate nice ends, and you're going to have the filling. And what I mean by that is I'm going to talk about Acts 13, and I'm going to, and I'm going to dive into Acts 15. But in Acts 14 with the filling, you're going to read that part. Okay, because it's, it's important, but what happens on the two ends is, is critical to impacting our lives today. So here I have kind of a map of what this first missions trip looked like. And I call it the Barnabas first missions trip for a reason, and you'll see that in a second here. This trip was 44 A.D. to 46 A.D. And by the way, Acts, just a reminder, Acts is written by Luke, right? So we just got to make sure that we understand who the author was. And you can see Antioch. You see Antioch of Syria. And there's actually a few Antiochs. It's Antioch's like Springfield. I guess, like, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Antioch here, Antioch there. So you're going to see that they start in Antioch. So let's start. Let's read Acts 13 a little bit here. So in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, uh, Manion, 
and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Pause there for a second. I think the words and the names are in order for a reason. It's Barnabas. Barnabas was the leader in this pack right now. In my opinion, I, I mean, I, obviously, just the way I'm reading the text, they talk Barnabas is first, and the last one is Saul, or Paul. Here it mentions Saul. When he talks about the Holy Spirit, who does the Holy Spirit call first? Barnabas and Paul. So I think when you're looking at this, this setting right now, at this very moment, Barnabas is the leader. Saul is beneath him at this, at, this, at this moment. So let's continue. What happened here? What are they doing? What happened? How did, could they hear the Spirit so clearly? They're worshiping. And fasting. You know, there's a reason why we, we did this whole 40 on 40, 40 for 40 before Easter about spending time with the Lord. And, there's all, and I just had a, I had a couple over last night and we were talking about fasting and how it's good for the body. How it's good for the body to, to there is evidence, like there's scientific evidence of what's, there's benefits of fasting. But clearly there are biblical benefits for fasting as well. You can hear God. You can hear the Holy Spirit clearer. But they were praying. They were worshiping. And it says here, after they heard this, what they, after they fasted and they prayed, they, so after they, they heard this message, they fasted, they prayed, and they placed hands on them and sent them off. So let's continue on the story. So they, they're at Antioch. They're going to go to this port city, and then they're going to head over to Cyprus. So let's continue reading here, going down. The two of them sent on their way, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. So Seleucia is the port city. And when they arrived at uh, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God to who first? In the Jewish synagogues. So they always, you're going to find this pattern. They go to the synagogues, they go to the Jews first, and then eventually you'll see in the filling of my Oreo cookie, when you read, when you read, you'll see that they go to the synagogue and then they go to the, um, the Gentiles. John was with them as their helper. That's going to be a whole other thing that we're going to talk about. Who is John? Okay. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Pathmos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant to the, pro, to the proconsul. To, to the, the, proconsul. the proconsul was an intelligent man. Uh, sent for, and he sent for Barnabas and Saul, again, notice the order, Barnabas and Saul, because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, who is also Bar is the same person, the sorcerer, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, it's like it's funny, like it's like, Luke, what are you doing to me here? Filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at him and said, you are a child of the devil and the enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Would you never stop perverting the way, the, the, the right way of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you and you are going to be blind. And for the time, you will be unable to see the light of the sun. And he immediately, mist and darkness came over him and he groped about asking, seeking someone to help him lead him by his hand. And the proconsul was like, what the heck? You know, he's, he, can you imagine that being like, okay, okay, I see, I believe. And he says, basically, he saw what happened. He believed, for he was amazed at the teachings about the Lord. Can you imagine going to somebody and just saying that line? You are the, I mean, it's like, you are a child of the devil. At that moment, at that moment, things change. In this whole mission strip, in my opinion, because when you get to the next page, the very next verse, from, Pap, from Paphos, Paul and his companions, not Barnabas and Paul, Paul and his companions sail to Perga. And they continue to go up on their way. And then 
They land in Perga, and John says, I'm out of here. John goes, John then left and returns to Jerusalem. Lots of things are happening here. The story shifts. I believe at that very moment, Barnabas, who was the leader, realized that Paul, being so full of the Spirit, I, I just have to believe that he said, you know what? It's time for me to step back. You got this. I mean, clearly you are full of the Spirit. From what I've seen, you have to lead this. Because throughout the rest of this chapter, it's all about Paul. He does, Barnabas, it's always now Paul and Barnabas. Before this very moment, it was Barnabas and Paul. So I think Luke purposely changes the order based upon what he sees. And I think Barnabas was a wise, he's, he's, again, this is a guy who encouraged the believers to even accept him into, remember in Acts 9, to come into their presence and say, hey, this guy's a real believer, he's the real thing. And now, moving forward, he's saying, hey, you are so full of the spirit. I, I'm watching this, I'm witnessing this. You take the lead, take the lead now. So I have a question here. Who's John Mark? Or who's John in this Bible? So on the next slide, John Mark, also known as Mark the Evangelist, he's not one of the, like, like I, this was a, I don't know if this is a shock or not, he's not one of the 12 original apostles, okay? He's not, all right? His mother's name is Mary, and we know this because in, Actually, Will talked about this in, in last week's sermon. When Peter breaks out, well, when, when, when Peter, I don't know if he breaks out, he escapes. The Lord just opens up the door and says, hey, I'm walking through. When he gets out of prison, he goes, in Acts 12, he goes to Mary's house, the mother of John Mark. Now, John is his Hebrew name. Mark is his Roman or Greek name. And I had a few questions when I saw that. I was like, I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm thinking, is everybody named Mary in the, Old, in, in the Bible? Like, what the heck? There's Mary this, Mary that, Mary this. But I thought, I was like, that's kind of strange. But being Italian, I can tell you, every one of my cousins is like Mario or Carmela. I don't understand it. Hey, it's my cousin Mario. My dad used to say, we're going to go visit cousin Mario. I'm like, which one? There's like, we have 50 of them. I don't know which one it is. That's Carmela. Yeah, but, like, it's like, could you name anybody? It's just, if you had a son, it was Mario. If it was a daughter, it was Carmela. I don't understand. So, I, when I saw it, I was like, all right, maybe they're like, you know, it's just like the Italian family. In Colossians 4.10, there's a reference that Barnabas and John Mark were related, that they're cousins. It's clear that he's younger, he's earlier in his faith, because he's, he's going, it says right here, he's going as a quote-unquote helper. He's not going to lead this trip, he's going as a helper. And ultimately, he becomes, in, I mean, we are, in 10 years from this moment, he ends up writing what many believe is the first gospel. They say it's the first gospel because the number of quotes from Mark compared to all the other ones is 647 out of the 678 verses are repeated in all the other gospels. This man who ran away after he landed, now you say, well, why did he land? Why did he run? Or why did he go back? There's no text on this. I tried to research, like, why did he go back? Why did he? But there's very little information of why Mark left. I have to believe that if he's related to Barnabas, he might have gone on this trip because he was following his cousin who was going to lead this trip. And at that moment when Barnabas said, hey, Paul, it's your turn. you got to lead it. He might have just said, I didn't sign up for this one. I didn't sign up for Paul to lead this trip. I signed up for Barnabas to lead it. I'm rolling out. I have, there's no text on it. At least I didn't see anything on it. But that's something that I believe that could have happened. That's, it's plausible that that could happen, that he could have had that feeling like, well, it's, I didn't sign up for a trip to, lead by, to, to be led by, by um, uh, Paul. So that is who John Mark is, but he becomes the author of Mark in the Bible, one of the four Gospels. So let's continue going back to the missions trip. So 
they continue to all these different cities, and this is the filling that you're going to read in the Oreo cookie. All right, this is the middle part of, uh, of, of, my, of, of what I'm going to skip. But know this, that they, every time they go, to the, they go to the synagogue, they go to the Jews first, and then they go to the Gentiles. And amazing things happen during this trip, during this two-and-a-half-year journey between Barnabas and Paul. But Mark departing at, at this very moment is going to have a big impact on their second missions trip, which we'll, hear, which, which we'll see shortly. So they end up returning. They end up going back. After this period of time, they end up going back to Antioch. And now let's skip over to 15. So they're in Antioch. And they, I read that they might be there for a few years. This isn't like they just landed and they end up going to Jerusalem. They're there for a few years. They were two and a half years out on the mission trip. Now they're back in Antioch. And it says here, some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute with the believers. So sharp, sharp dis dispute and uh, debated with them. So I don't know what your version says. I've looked at different versions. It's like some of them are even worse than sharp dispute. I don't know what, what, if, you've, if, if you want to just kind of see what, what yours says. Clearly, this is, this is not a gray area for them. Paul and Barnabas are saying, no, we totally disagree with you. This is not accurate. You do not have to be circumcised per the law of Moses to be saved. And they're getting into this big discussion. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem. They always say go up to Jerusalem. And you're like, well, wait, Jerusalem was further south because Jerusalem's on a mountain. Everything goes up to the mountain. When they say, hey, I'm going up to Jerusalem because your elevation is going up. Okay, so you're going up to Jerusalem. Every time you go to Jerusalem, you're going up. All right. To see the apostles and the elders about this question. Okay, so now let's go down a little bit here. And we're going we're gonna to continue the story in 15.5. Uh, so some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Now this is... I, find, I found this when I read this. I was like, wow, this is pretty interesting. A sect, you got to remember, at this moment, Judea, th this, this, uh, the followers are still a sect, considered a sect of Judaism. Okay, this is not, they haven't separated. The separation doesn't happen until the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. Okay, this is when it's truly separated and there's a big division between Christians and Jews. In, in, in that period of time. But as of right now, they are still considered a sect of Judaism. But I find it interesting that the Pharisees, there's a sect, like this church, this early church, it, we're not even 10 to 15 years removed from the, from the crucifixion, and there is already different groups saying, well, you got to do this. No, you got to do this. You got to do this. The Pharisees, these are the same people who crucified, these are these, the sect of the Pharisees, who were the ones who were like, hey, we want... Barabbas over, you know, crucify him. It was the Pharisees. But now you have a sect of believers, a group of believers that were from the party of the Pharisees who truly believe that only through circumcision, only through following the law of Moses will you truly be saved. And in this particular situation that is going to impact us today, the, this, this decision that is made at this particular conference. I call it like the first Grand Poobah Connect convention. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, it's like, like you know, you have the, they come up, and then you have on the other side, Peter stands up and says, hey, listen, I got to address you guys. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message that the gospel, of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, knows the heart, 
showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do we try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples? Who are the disciples? These are now the Gentiles, right? These are the, the young believers, the followers, a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to, to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of the Lord Jesus that we are saved, just that, that we are saved just as they are. And it and look at that. Look at it. The whole assembly became silent. It was like, what? Like, that is a huge change, a huge shift to what was being believed at that very moment. And Barnabas and Paul at this time now stand up and they, they share everything that has happened on their story on this trip about what they were seeing with the Gentiles and how they were changing and how they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And then you have this moment where James stands up. And he says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles, it's in, in James 15, 19, who are, who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached through every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. There are three major differences in what's going on. The Pharisees are still stuck. They don't get it. They're still focusing on circumcision as a gateway to getting saved. But as we all know and we're hearing and we're reading, it's in the heart. The circumcision happens in the heart. We're, like if, if, and actually my wife, my wife sent me a text. Let me, uh, I don't know, it was... It, she sent me a text. We were talking about this very topic yesterday, just telling her what I was going to say. She said, Deuteronomy 36, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and your hearts and the hearts of your descendants, not just you, but the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all of your heart and with all your soul and live. They got it wrong. They're, 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 we still get it wrong. We get it wrong even today. Sometimes we look at this and we say, well, we can do whatever. God, God's full of grace. I can sit there and sin. I can do this. I can continue with my sexual immorality, my, my cheating, my whatever. It doesn't matter because God's all about grace and, God's, and, grace, and grace will just pour over me. Yeah, well, I don't know. Because it is, faith is a requirement. But James is putting other things in there. There's. He's asking you to abstain from foods. I believe the reason is that as believers, we should be changing. We should be changing over time. Things that were once very normal for us and very typical and say, hey, you know, I used to do, I'll give you an example. I started a company in 2002. I was, I went to church since, 2000, since 1998 uh, when I met Janice. And I would go to church and do my thing and do my, you know, one hour here and go back out and, like, pretend nothing happened. And I started a company, and when I started my company, I remember one of my clients um, in, one, in, in Atlanta, uh, and I was starting this company. I, I was all this pressure on me to build this company. His big thing, want to go to strip bars. Brian, Brian, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you this money, but you got to go to strip bars. I went to strip bars. I did. Because I was like, hey, I can separate the two. I'm just going to be like, hey, this is, this is to feed my family. But in the end, now I look at it, it was so wrong. Like, it is wrong for us to even, I sit there and say, Lord, I, I got to confess, Lord. That was the wrong, I, there needs to be change in us through, through this belief if all we're doing is saying, hey, well, I, have, I have faith in Jesus. Yes, I do. I have faith in Jesus. How about you? And you're not, and there is no change in you, and you are not seeing fruit, then there's, a, then there's something blocking it. 
And that's why I talk about that, that, that series on June, the, the event that we're having. Maybe there is something in your heart that's hardened, that's preventing true change that's happening. Maybe there's something that you have to get into and look through your generational lines. Because it says right here, circumcision in your heart, not just for you, but for your descendants. So maybe there's something even that you don't even realize that happened from your father or mother or them. And you have to address those as well. Listen, it's, it's, a, it's clear to me. It's so clear. It's, you don't need to be clearly option one here. We can all agree that's not necessary. But there is a circumcision. And it's the circumcision of our hearts. Okay? And, you know, going back, let's continue actually moving. Let's, let's continue on, on to the story here. Because, and then we're going to have about, about you, about, what about you and me? I'm going to fast forward. They write this letter to the church of Antioch. And they share with them this news that, hey, it's not about circumcision. It's about faith. But they do put some requirements in there about don't be eating this, don't be eating that. And I truly believe we can look at that and say we, we should be changing. There should be clear change in us every day. But let's kind of, let's dive down into, a, we're going to finish up Acts 15 and then do the what, what about you and me. Sometime later... So, so, again, Paul and Barnabas are back up to Antioch because they sent them up there, and, and they're, they're sharing the story. Sometime later, Paul and Barnabas get together and they say, hey, let's go back to the place we visited. With, you know, it's like, hey, let's go check out the churches that we planted back in, you know, in 44 A.D. Let's go back out there and see how they're doing. And where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're all doing. And Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark with them but Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them remember when they landed he was like I'm out of here and they parted can you imagine this these are two friends that hung out together for two and a half years actually more than two and a half years because they they this is a man who took him Barnabas the encourager took him to the apostles and said hey he's a good guy don't worry he's not going to kill you he's changed this is a guy who goes and pursues Paul in Tarsus, brings him in. This is a man who yields and says, okay, you lead. Two and a half years, they spend, they go back. They're, 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 they're standing in front of the, the apostles saying, hey, look what's happening with, within this mission trip. And they part. They just part over one guy that, like, deserted them. I think this shows the humanism. They're human. They're, like, I don't think it's right for Paul. I don't, I don't think it was right for Paul to be like, dude, I don't want to go with you because of, uh, because of um, your, your, your cousin bolted. But I think it shows how human they are. We put these guys on some pedestal. Like, they're like, whoa, man, look how amazing they were. They're human, just like you and me. And they're not perfect. And, he, and they parted ways. And Paul continues his journey through land. Barnabas follows the exact same path that they did and goes to Cyprus. Anybody know what happened to Barnabas? Barnabas is never heard of again. Barnabas, I had to, re, I had to research this. Barnabas dies on Cyprus as a martyr for, for, for Christ. I actually read something like that. They, they, I, I don't know if they, they wrapped him. They, they put a rope around him and, and drug him out. And Mark, his cousin, was there to watch this whole thing. He never leaves Cyprus. According to, there's another, there's, I, per what I read, he never, reads, he never leaves. Because you never hear of him again. But Barnabas was critical in the whole story. If Barnabas didn't do what he did, two-thirds of the New Testament might not be written by Paul. He was a key piece in this whole thing. And then taken like that when they split up. You know, the funny thing about this, before I get into my last, into, into that slide, you could think about that and you could say, wow, man, um, 
John Mark might have been really pissed off. Like it might have, it, that relationship must, must have been severed forever. But it, you actually, if you go to 2 Timothy uh, 4, 9 through 12, Paul is in the end here. Actually, I see if I have it. 2 Timothy. Sorry, I should have marked it, but I didn't. You know, what can I tell you? All right, 2 Timothy 4, at the end, he goes, his, his, his final remarks. In 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 12, do your best, he's obviously talking to Timothy, to come to me quickly. For Dimas, uh, because he loved this world, he's deserted me. All these people have de deserted me. This person's gone to uh, Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And that, look what he says. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. He actually asked for Mark. The guy that deserted him, he asks by him by name. He says, hey, bring Mark to me. Bring Mark back to me. Because he now can see that Mark, maybe he was young. Maybe he, maybe he freaked out. Maybe he, you know, he landed and said, I'm out of here. I want to go back to Jerusalem. I don't want to go on this boat trip with you. But he realized, no, no, no. Mark is super valuable to this ministry. So what about you and me? What can we learn about this whole story? The impact that it had on us. I mean, think about what was going on. If they didn't go on this trip... Would we still have to say, hey, no, you have to be Jewish before, before you, you have to be circumcised before you can be saved? The impact that it had on the Gentiles, the decision that was made at that first Grand Poobah meeting without Paul and Barnabas mentioning the, the, the impact that they had on, their, on, their, on, their, on this journey. What can we learn about Paul and Mark? Our past mistakes don't have to define our future. How many of you guys have messed up? Like we sit there and go, oh, man, I messed up in my faith. It's like messed up in ministry, your life. You can still get back into the game. Mark bolted out. He was like, hey, I'm out of here. I'm going back to Jerusalem. We could have just said, you know, he doesn't mean that he, and he became one of the writers of the gospel, one of the four gospels. It's never too late to, re to reconnect with someone you've let down. I think um, when you look at 2 Timothy and Paul asking, hey, bring Mark to me. I want to see him. There's a reconciliation that's happening. There's, and that goes to point number two. It's never too late to forgive someone who let you down. I'm sure he was disappointed. I'm sure clearly he was so disappointed that they, bro they, they separated ways. To, to, you know, where, where, where Paul goes with Silas, Barnabas goes with John Mark, created that much division over a person leaving? But they're human. They're not supernatural. They, they have feelings. They got angry. We're not perfect. They're not perfect. We're not perfect. But we can still be in the game. God can use our imperfections in a way that make it powerful to those that are that he's seek, seeking that he's searching for I have no idea what that was all right okay I'm like a little nervous this is going to fall on me um, maybe it's just like it's dinner it's food time okay don't worry we're almost done here what can we take away from um, from Barnabas I mean, here's a guy who's an encourager. We don't, we don't hear from him a lot. We don't talk about Barnabas a lot. But when I read this these last three chapters, and I, did, I went back to, to Acts 9, he was so critical in this missions trip, but he gets no credit for it. We all talk about Paul and, and what Paul did. But Barnabas was an ingredient, a key ingredient to us Getting to this point where you don't need to, it's through faith only, through change, and, and will be changed. But it, it's no longer about circumcision. 
through through what we know about through Moses and the Old Testament. Oh, what's going on with this this mic thing? All right. I don't know. I don't know. I'll just scream it. All right. So, how do we, they clearly heard from the Spirit, right? They clearly, you could see it at, in Acts 13. And we always say, well, how are they hearing from the Spirit and we don't? So, I'm going to put together a few key things on how we can hear the Spirit better in our lives. Okay? What do we do? What, like, like, all right, I'm shutting this thing off and just screaming it. I don't understand what's going on here. Because this is weird. Boop, 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 boop. Hello, can you hear me? All right, well, we'll just do it this way. The Bible, like, let's not reinvent what was already in the Bible. They say worship, worship God. They talk about fasting. We should fast. Like, put it in your program. I, my wife fasts all the time, I, and I'm just like, I don't want to fast. I'm hungry all the time. But I should. And so I'm going to just start mourning my daughter. I'm so be careful. I'm going to be fasting. But we should because the Bible says it's good. We'll hear from God more. Prayer. But here's the deal, guys. Don't sit there and say, oh, Lord, help him and help him and help him and, and everybody else. No. Like, what changed me is I started confessing. I said, Lord, like, okay, my daughter's going to college. I'm like, Lord, like, I tried to, con Lord, protect her here, protect her there. Now, now I got to go, Lord, I confess. I'm trying to control her safety, and I'm releasing it to you, Lord. I confess that I am trying to literally micromanage her happiness. It's wrong. Oh, you can make her happy. I might make her happy for a second, but you can make her happy for your own time. So I am releasing it to you, and I'm taking a step back. So confess it and repent. Turn and say, Lord, I am not going down this direction anymore. I'm leaving it in your hands to do X, Y, and Z. But if you are praying without confessing, there is not going to be change. You're not, you're not going to change. It's just not going to happen. You have to confess it to unlock what's happening in your heart and so that, this, that God can then restore it with truth. Okay? And forgive yourself. Like I said, you're not perfect. They're not perfect. They had one argument and broke up, broke up the Beatles, broke up the band, okay? We're not perfect either. Forgive yourself. Hey, you know what? I got to forgive myself. I, I, I forgive them, and I forgive myself. You know, forgiveness is for you. Like when, when people say, oh, I don't want to forgive them. No, no, no. Forgiveness is so you can move forward. So if someone has wronged you, I'm not saying you have to hang out with them and be best friends with them, but there is a point where you have to say to yourself, I forgive that person. I, I have to forgive them because I can't move forward until I can forgive that person. And I forgive myself for making my, the mistakes I did. So I ask you guys, please, like, do it. Like, get, be, be intentional. Confession, repentance, forgive. And then, which I'm not good at, I'll be the first to admit it, is listen. Because my brain, I'm like, uh, okay, I did all this stuff, and then I'm like, all right, now I got to go. No, spend some time actually listening. God might actually be talking to you. And if you actually stop and, and like, put your, your phone away, put your little action, you know, all your little checklist items that you have to get done, and just spend a moment listening, you might actually hear something. They did. There's nothing special about them. There was nothing unique about them. There's nothing special about, you know, what they had some higher power. No, you have every power that Paul has. Now, I'm not saying go around and tell people they're gonna go, like, that, that they're the devil child and they're going to go blind. I'm not, I'm not promoting that. But you have power that God has given you. God has given each and every one of you power. The question is, do you believe it? So with that, 
I'm going to, this is, this is what I've learned through my steps, through my process. Each and every one of you, if you are not seeing change in your walk, if you are not moving forward, go back to those steps. It's, it's a simple blueprint. God loves you. He wants you. He, he wants to help you. But I believe it's through these five steps. Okay? So on that note, I'm going to ask the band to come back up. The trio. Soon to be just a bass guitarist, Getty Lee. Let's hear it for Getty Lee coming up. I'm sorry. I'm going to steal your mic for a second here. All righty. So, so let's, just, let's just pray for a moment and ask God to, to speak to us. Let's take this moment to ask for forgiveness. Let's take this moment to confess. If there is something that is pressing in your heart and you're like, Lord, I got to confess this. I am feeling this right now. I'm feeling whatever it is. Listen, we have people here who are prayer warriors in this congregation. If you need to pray with somebody, just tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I need to get this out. I need prayer right now. So if it's stirring in your heart, don't, don't press it down and say, oh, I just want to ignore it. Express it, confess it, and repent. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, Lord. We just thank you for this congregation, this time for fellowship, Lord. We just, we just praise you for using character, people, time, ships, just miraculous things that are happening in this missions trip. You use people that I never thought would be vital, but everyone in this story was vital to getting to us a freedom, freedom that it is through faith, Lord, that you have made us Gentiles, Jews. It is free for every one of us to have salvation, Lord, to be free. Lord, we, we just confess, Lord, whatever is in our heart, Lord, we confess that we're trying to control things, Lord. We confess that we don't want to let go, Lord. We confess, Heavenly Father, that, that we don't trust you. Lord, we confess that, that we, we think you're going to leave us in the worst period of time, Lord. Lord, we confess that we have envy. We confess that we have bitterness. We confess that we're jealous. Lord, I just ask that you heal us, Lord. Help us turn from these, these feelings, Lord, and restore truth in what you really think of us. Heavenly Father, I just, I just ask that you speak to each and every one of us, Lord. Tell us where you want us. You, you, we know that you want to hear us. You want a relationship with each and every one of us. So, Lord, I just ask at this moment of silence that you just speak to us. Speak to us. I'm done trusting in what seems in me. These boats weren't built for me. I'm done drifting on the water of insecurity. In the noise and the distractions, in the storms of arguing, I hear your voice calling. Oh, I'm gonna face miles of pieces, walking with the one who walks on
you real quick. Yeah. So stay on hands. Dear Lord, we use this time to just come together and spend time with you and just learn about your word, Father. I pray that you would go before us. Bless this food, Lord. Um, may we have a great time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.